You're listening to Audiology. Support our work on Patreon and be sure to submit your requests for topics in the comments below. Two years into the American Revolutionary War, the British shifted their strategy. They gave up on trying to win back the New England colonies, which were in open rebellion. Instead, they aimed to split the 13 colonies, hoping to separate New England from the southern colonies, which they believed were more loyal to the British crown. The British commanders came up with a big strategy. They planned to cut the colonies in half by moving towards Albany, New York, from three different directions. The attack plan was like a three-pronged fork. From the west, Barry St. Ledger was supposed to move east from Lake Ontario. However, his force was turned back during the siege of Fort Stanwix, so that part of the plan didn't work out. The southern prong was supposed to come up from New York City towards Albany, but that never happened because General William Howe changed his mind and decided to go after Philadelphia instead. The only prong of the plan that saw any real success was the northern one, starting from Montreal and moving south. The British, led by General John Burgoyne, scored victories at Fort Ticonderoga, Hubberton and Fort Anne. Burgoyne was pushing forward with his Saratoga campaign, with the big goal of taking Albany. If he could do that and gain control of the Hudson River Valley, the plan was for his forces to link up with the other two prongs, effectively splitting the colonies in half. Imagine this. General Burgoyne was making his advance towards Albany and actually got off to a pretty good start. He even managed to disperse Seth Warner's troops in the Battle of Hubberton. But as July was ending, his advance had significantly slowed down. Why? Well, because moving his forces became incredibly tough. Not only were they facing natural logistical problems, but the American forces had also gone and destroyed a crucial road, making things even more difficult. And, as you might assume, their supplies started to run really low. Things got even more complicated in early August for Burgoyne. That's when he found out from General Howe that Howe wasn't going to advance up the Hudson River Valley to meet him as expected. Instead, Howe was headed to Philadelphia. Now, Burgoyne had already been worried about supplies, and this piece of news did not help. In an attempt to solve, he remembered a suggestion from July 22nd by Baron Riedersel, the leader of his German troops. So, he decided to send about 800 soldiers on a mission to essentially go grocery shopping, but instead of food... They were after horses for the German cavalry units, draft animals to help move their gear, and while they were at it, to annoy the enemy as much as possible. This group, led by Lieutenant Colonel Friedrich Baum, was mainly composed of dismounted Brunswick Army dragoons from the Prince Ludwig Regiment. They weren't alone, though. Along the way, they picked up some local loyalists, Canadians, about a hundred Native American allies, and a company of British sharpshooters. Initially, Baum was intended to head to the Connecticut River Valley, where they believed they could find a bunch of horses. But at the last minute, Burgoyne changed the plan. He directed Baum to head to a supply depot in Bennington instead, thinking it might be an easier target since it was supposedly only guarded by what remained of Warner's brigade, around 400 colonial militia troops. After the British captured Ticonderoga, people living in what is now Vermont, but back then was a land caught in a tug of war between New York and the Vermont Republic, sought help from New Hampshire and Massachusetts. They were looking to defend themselves against the approaching British army. New Hampshire quickly stepped up on July 18th, giving John Stark the go-ahead to gather a militia specifically for defending the locals or to cause trouble for the British. Thanks to financial support from John Langdon, Stark impressively rounded up 1,500 men from New Hampshire in just six days. That's over 10% of the state's eligible male population at the time. These men first headed to Fort at Number 4, now known as Charlestown, New Hampshire. From there, they crossed the Connecticut River, made a stop in Manchester to plan things out with Warner. While in Manchester, a bit of drama unfolded when General Benjamin Lincoln, who had previously been chosen for a promotion over Stark, leading to Stark quitting the Continental Army, tried to take charge of Stark and his militia. Stark wasn't having any of it, insisting he answered only to New Hampshire's orders. Stark and Warner then pressed on to Bennington, leaving Warner's troops in Manchester. Lincoln, on the other hand, went back to the American camp at Stillwater. There, he and General Philip Schuyler cooked up a scheme to have Lincoln, with 500 men, link up with Stark and Warner to disrupt Burgoyne's supply lines at Skanesboro. However, an unexpected move by Baum threw a wrench in their plans. On August 9th, Baum's German troops left their camp at Fort Edward and made their way to Fort Miller. There they paused until they were joined by Indian allies and a group of skilled British marksmen. On August 11th, they started their march towards Bennington. Along the way, after a few small clashes, they captured some prisoners who revealed that a substantial force awaited them at Bennington. By August 14th, Baum encountered a scouting party from Stark's forces, 
looking into reports of Indian activity. Stark's men pulled back, tactically destroying a bridge to slow down Baum's advance. Hearing about the oncoming Germans, Stark requested reinforcements from Manchester and moved his troops into a strategic position to face Baum's force. Initially, Baum messaged Burgoyne, believing the American forces would likely back down despite their numbers. However, after moving closer to Stark's location, Baum realised the situation was more formidable than he first thought, prompting him to request backup. The weather turned against them, with rain halting any potential conflict for one and a half days. During this break, Baum's troops built a redoubt on a hilltop, hoping the weather delay would buy time for reinforcements to arrive. Despite the rain making it tough to keep gunpowder dry, Stark's forces managed to eliminate 30 of Baum's Indian allies with their skirmishers. On August 15th, reinforcements struggled through the rain to support both sides. Burgoyne dispatched 550 men under Heinrich von Bremen, while Stark was reinforced by about 350 Green Mountain Boys, led by Lieutenant Samuel Safford from Manchester. That same night, Parson Thomas Allen and his Massachusetts militiamen arrived, eager to join Stark. Stark reassured Allen, promising battle the following day if the weather cleared up, which inspired more locals to join his cause. Stark's numbers, excluding those commanded by Warner, approached 2,000 men. The next morning of August 16th, Baum's camp also received unexpected support from nearly 100 local loyalists bolstering their strength. On a clear afternoon on August 16th, the weather improved, and Stark got his troops ready for an attack. He is famously known for motivating his soldiers by emphasising that they were fighting for their natural-born rights as Englishmen. He pointed out their enemies, the Red Coats and the Tories, and starkly warned that victory was crucial. Otherwise, Molly Stark sleeps a widow. When Stark observed the militia disappearing into the woods, Baum mistakenly thought the Americans were either retreating or repositioning. Instead, Stark was actually taking advantage of the German forces' scattered arrangement by sending large groups to flank both sides of his lines. Stark's men cleverly approached closer without raising suspicion, thanks to a trick where they added bits of white paper in their hats to signal alliance to the Germans, who believed anyone with such a sign was a loyalist. The battle commenced around 3 p.m., and the German defences were quickly overwhelmed by gunfire, described by Stark as the fiercest he'd ever seen, like a continual clap of thunder. The Loyalists and Indian allies were quickly defeated, either fleeing or being captured. This left Baum's forces isolated on higher ground. Despite running low on supplies and losing their ammunition wagon, the Germans, led by Baum, bravely attempted a last sabre charge to break through the encircling forces. This attempt disastrously failed, resulting in significant German casualties and achieving no breakthrough with Baum getting fatally injured. While Stark's men were occupied with taking prisoners and scavenging for supplies, they were caught off guard by the arrival of Bryman and his reinforcements. Despite the initial chaos, Stark's soldiers managed to regroup and tried to resist the new German attack but started to lose ground. Just in time, Warner's forces arrived to bolster Stark's troops, and the fierce combat continued until darkness fell, leading to both sides withdrawing. Bremen, who had lost a quarter of his forces and all his cannons, decided to retreat hastily. In the Battle of Bennington, the German and British forces faced significant losses, with 207 of their soldiers killed and another 700 taken prisoner. On the American side, 30 soldiers lost their lives and 40 were wounded. This battle was fiercely fought, especially between loyalists and patriots, who often hailed from the same neighbourhoods. Initially, the captured prisoners were held in Bennington, but they were later marched to Boston for detention. When General Burgoyne, leading the British forces, heard about the battle on August 17th as his troops were preparing to cross the Hudson at Fort Edward, he considered sending more forces to Bennington. However, he halted this plan upon learning that the surviving members of his force were already on their way back. Throughout the day and night, more of his scattered troops returned, bringing with them the dire news of their defeat. This defeat was a major blow to Burgoyne's campaign. Not only did he lose nearly 1,000 men, half of whom were experienced troops, but he also lost the invaluable support of the Native American warriors, who had accompanied him from Quebec. Many decided to return home after a council post-battle, leaving Burgoyne without crucial reconnaissance capabilities. This, coupled with the inability to secure nearby supplies, forced him to depend on already overstretched supply lines. These logistical challenges were instrumental in his ultimate surrender at Saratoga, a setback that prompted France to join the war against Britain. The American patriots, on the other hand, were buoyed by their victory at Bennington. The departure of Burgoyne's Native American scouts emboldened local patriot groups 
to start harassing British outposts. Although many of John Stark's soldiers went home after the battle, they regrouped for a critical action at Saratoga on October 13th, sealing Burgoyne's fate. John Stark, the leader of the American forces at Bennington, was handsomely rewarded for his achievements. The New Hampshire General Assembly gifted him a complete set of clothes befitting his rank, but perhaps the most significant acknowledgement came from John Hancock, the President of the Continental Congress. Hancock expressed his gratitude in a letter to Stark and awarded him the commission of brigadier in the United States Army, an honor Stark held in high esteem. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts in the comments and subscribe for more content.